Good afternoon, Professor Hemmings. I understand that, today, you will explain the so-called one-drop rule. That's right, Karen. You asked about it in another session, and I could not answer in depth. And so, I thought that I would explain it in detail today. I am sure that our viewers are looking forward to it. The one drop rule is a US tradition about people of mixed ancestry. It says that someone of European appearance is really black, like it or not, if she has one drop of known African ancestry, no matter how ancient. The obsolescent notion labels people of mixed ancestry as merely passing for white. Recent examples are actors Peter Ustinov and Heather Locklear. Historical examples are Alexander Pushkin and John James Audubon. Americans with distant, but known African ancestry are often labeled as black by U.S. press and public, despite their European appearance, despite their personal non-black self-identity. Today's presentation covers six points, first, the one-drop rule reflects a conflict between two folkloric traditions. Second, it appears only in the United States. Third, it applies only to the black-white color line. Fourth, it had no connection with slavery. Fifth black politicians, not white ones, have enforced the one-drop rule for most of the past two centuries. Finally, since 1990, the one-drop tradition may be fading away in U.S. popular culture. Why a conflict between two U.S. traditions? The first, is that your racial classification is determined by your appearance, skin tone, hair texture, facial features, and the like. The second, is that your racial classification is determined by your ancestry. The two traditions can contradict each other. On the one hand, most Americans agree that someone who looks black, is black, even if neither parent self-identified as African American, US President Obama, for instance. But many Americans also agree, that someone born into the African American community who looks white and self-identifies as white is also secretly black, Carol Channing's father, for instance. The one drop rule is unique to the United States. It is hard for residents of other countries to grasp that the notion of invisible blackness is widely accepted and often legally enforced in the United States today. To most people around the world, the claim that someone looks white but is really black is as nonsensical as saying that someone looks tall but is really short. They are just passing for tall. In every other nation, if you look white, and consider yourself white, then you are white. The one drop rule is unique to the black-white US dichotomy. An American may legally claim to be one-fourth Cherokee, one-fourth Irish, or one-fourth Russian, and still choose some other ethnic self-identity, such as German. But an American who admits to being one-fourth black, is not given such a choice. Unlike every other U.S. ethnicity, you cannot legally choose to be partly African American. If you check off more than one race box in the U.S. Census, and one of the boxes was black, then you are classified as solely black, no matter how many other boxes you checked. The one drop rule had nothing to do with slavery. Like most U.S. myths regarding that nation's unique endogamous color line, folkloric tradition says that it has something to do with slavery. U.S. popular culture as well as academia teach Americans to blame long-dead slavery for their current polity. This resembles the way that Americans blame slavery for their racialism and their endogamous color line itself. In fact, slavery was ubiquitous throughout the hemisphere, while the latter phenomena remain unique to the United States. The actual legal connection between slavery and physical appearance was precisely the reverse. A person of any visible European ancestry was presumed to be free. The court case is Gobu v. Gobu, 1802 North Carolina, Hudgens v. Wrights, 1806 Virginia, and Adele v. Beauregard, 1810 Louisiana, established the U.S. case law that if you had any discernible European ancestry, you were presumed to be free. In such cases, the burden was on the alleged slave owner to prove that you were legally a slave through matrilineal descent. 
This law was then followed in hundreds of court cases without exception until U.S. slavery was ended by the 13th Amendment. The one-drop rule first appeared in the free states of the Ohio Valley in the 1830s. It was not accepted in the South until long after the Civil War. It first became statutory in 1910 and did not spread nationwide until the 1920s. The one-drop rule was historically enforced more by blacks than by whites. Except for one 50-year period of U.S. history, the one-drop rule has been believed more strongly and enforced more harshly by African-American political leaders than by white Americans. The exceptional period was the Jim Crow era of state-sponsored terrorism against African-Americans. During the Jim Crow era, which ended around 1965, the one-drop rule kept compassionate white families in line by legally exiling to blackness any white family who defended African Americans against the terror. During the Jim Crow era, the one-drop rule was never legally applied in court to any family who self-identified as black. It was used only against whites. In all other periods, from the 1830s to today, the one-drop rule was an instrument of intra-ethnic coercion by African-American political leaders. It is still used thus today. It is used to punish those born into the African-American community who wish to self-identify as something other than black in adulthood. It accuses them of being sellouts and race traitors. There are two reasons to think that the one-drop rule may be fading away. First, a recent survey asked, what race is someone with black ancestry who looks white and self-identifies as white? Only 18% of Americans answered, black passing for white. 81% answered, white. Second, it appears that, since 1990, intermarried parents may be moving away from the tradition. One way of measuring the tenacity of the one-drop rule is by examining how black-white intermarried parents identify their children on the census race question. If intermarried parents accept the legitimacy of African-American ethnic self-identity while simultaneously rejecting the one-drop rule, you would expect half of their children to be identified as white and half as black. Recall. From our discussion of the heredity of racial traits, that such children's appearance is symmetrically distributed. In fact, the children of intermarried parents have been more often identified as black than as white since 1880. This shows that the one-drop rule has been accepted for many decades. To be precise, the fraction of such children labeled as white has fallen steadily from 50% in 1940, which is what you would expect from genetics to 13% in 2000. This graph, taken from the US Census shows a steady decline, over the past 70 years, in the number of children of interracial marriages, who are considered white, by their own parents. At first glance, this suggests that the one-drop rule is growing ever stronger today among black-white interracial parents. On the other hand, the fraction of such children labeled as unmixed black has also dropped abruptly from 62% in 1990 to 31% in 2000. Again, this chart from the US Census shows a sudden drop over the past decade in the number of children of interracial marriages who are considered black by their own parents. How can the fraction of white label children and that of black label children have both fallen since 1990? As it turns out, growing numbers of interracially married parents are rejecting the idea of having only two choices. This chart superimposes the two previous charts in order to show what is happening. The white area at the top reflects the fraction of biracial children labeled as white by their parents. The black area at the bottom shows how many were labeled as black. The gray gap in the center shows the fraction of parents who rejected the dichotomy itself. It shows, for each census decade since 1960, the percentage of children whose parents rejected a binary choice by either writing in multiracial, biracial, none of the above, or by checking multiple boxes. In 1960, parents were not allowed to check off other, nor to write something in. They had to pick one and only one of the given choices. In 1970, for the first time, they were allowed to choose other. In 1970, 
4% of first-generation biracial children were reported as neither black nor white. In 1980, this number had grown to 8%, and many parents checked both boxes, despite this being explicitly forbidden by the instructions. By 1990, the number who rejected choosing between black and white had grown to 13%. In 2000, for the first time, parents were allowed to check multiple boxes, and millions of parents jumped at the opportunity. In the 2000 census, well over half, 56% of first-generation biracial children were coded as belonging simultaneously to both races. In conclusion, as shown in other sessions, the impact of racialism on U.S. society is worsening, especially in the sense of socioeconomic class. The net worth gap between white and black Americans continues widening. On the other hand, judging by this chart, judging by how parents answer the census race question about their children, the notion that, if you have even the slightest African ancestry, you must be black and nothing more, seems to be losing its grip on the American mind. The one drop rule seems to be fading away in America. And that is my presentation for today Karen. Thank you for listening. Thank you Professor. Very interesting as always. Professor, you said that U.S. racism is worsening. As an example, you said that the net worth gap between white and black Americans is widening. On the other hand, you said that the one-drop rule may be fading away. The two observations seem contradictory. How do you reconcile them? Well Karen, the problem is that the five most important indicators do not agree. Three of the five indicators measure the differences in how black and white Americans fare in society. Those three indicators are, the test score gap, the net worth gap, and the crime gap. The test score gap measures, how well African American children perform in school, compared to white children. The net worth gap measures the financial success of African American families, compared to white families. And the crime gap measures the rate of at which African Americans commit violent crimes, or become victims of violent crime, compared to white Americans. The other two of the five indicators measure the strength or harshness of the US race notion itself. One is the rate of exogamy or intermarriage. The other is the rate of social acceptance of a multiracial or biracial self-identity. What do you mean, when you say that they disagree? The three indicators of African American success or acceptance are steeply worsening today. The test score gap, the net worth gap, and the crime gap are all widening. On the other hand, the two indicators of the strength of the race notion itself are improving. Both intermarriage and acceptance of mixed heritage self-identity are increasing. And so, it seems that African Americans are not being fully accepted by mainstream society, while at the same time, people of dual ancestry are not always seen as African Americans. All in all then Professor, is the fading of the harshly defined US color line a good thing? I wish I knew. I suppose that it depends on your vision of the ideal society. Let me answer with an example. There is a new world society today that lacks the endogamous barrier of a color line, where people marry one another without regard to their fraction of European versus African ancestry, where everyone is mixed to a greater or lesser extent, where the Jim Crow cataclysm never happened, and where the notion of a one-drop rule is laughed at. This society is found in Latin America. And yet colorism is worse in Latin America than in the United States. People who look more European have more doors open to them throughout their lives, schools, jobs, political and social status, all depend on how European you look. Indeed, advertisements specify that this position or that is open only to applicants who look mostly European. Is such a society better or worse than the United States, where African Americans are segregated in fact, but civil rights laws forbid overt colorism? I cannot answer. I see. When you put it that way, it is a difficult choice. Well, we are out of time again, so we must bid our viewers goodbye. This is Karen Sharp. And Randolph Hemmings. Signing off.